scripture comes from Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, who, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three, do you think, proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. This is the word of God. We're getting toward the end of this series, part nine, and um, this is the second time I'm preaching in this important passage, the passage of the Good Samaritan. And last week, we had a really, we had a hard message. We looked at the first half of this message where Jesus, it's very, very pointed. It's an explosively controversial passage where, in a sense, the hero of this story is someone that the Jews look down in a very racist manner. And um, it's very deliberate by Jesus. And we explored this question of who is our neighbor. And today we're going to look at the second half of this passage where we, um, well, I don't have my Bible in front of me, can I grab a Bible? <laughs> um, the second half of this passage where we are going to take a look at the Samaritan's actions. What is it that he did that the Levite and the priest did not do? And, um, and so we're going to look at this in three parts. And especially what, um, one of the question I want us to think about today is to, to what extent, how far do we need to go to help other people? What is a, how far are we supposed to put out? And um, that's the question, the extent in my message today called the extent of mercy in three parts. Part one. How much compassion should we have? That's the first question. We're going to look at the passage in that. How much compassion are we to have? And part two, what kind of mercy um, should we pursue, pursue? I don't know if you've ever thought of this or know this. Most of us, when we think about mercy, we think of especially, we live, we live in, in, in a wealthy society. I mean, you know, compared to most of the other societies um, on this planet, we are one of the, we're not just a wealthy society, one of the wealthiest societies that's ever been on this planet. And then we live in one of the wealthiest cities in one of the wealthiest societies that's ever been on our earth. And so when we think about uh, mercy and, or w toward someone who is poor or hurting, we may think of someone like um, who is a beggar or, or, or a homeless person that we encounter in the street. But And then we immediately think of of uh, giving food or money, or we may think of um, shelters or soup kitchens. I mean, that's, that's a very common. Those are the common ways that we think about mercy in our society. But that's a very limited way of thinking about mercy. What should mercy be like, think, um, um, look like? And there's more than one way. And that's what we're going to talk about in, in part two. 
And in part three, I want to close with a picture of the gospel. The God who empowered us to be fully human. That's part three. The God who empowered us to be fully human. Okay. Let's get to part one. How much compassion should we have? Verse 33. Let's look at verse 33. Um, here's what he said. I said. But a Samaritan, so, so far what we have is we've had the, the priest, and then we've had a Levite um, who come by, and both of them just kind of go, ooh, you know, and then they kind of like you know, deliver. They can see this person beaten up, um, really hurt, uh, could be possibly dying, lying there in the middle of the road, and then they deliberately, you know, very, very pointed. They go around to the other side. And then we get this person who is, uh, who is um, you know, completely, in, in this culture, understand a priest, a Levite. A priest and a Levite are both considered um, not only more religiously upright and righteous people because they both serve the temple. They both serve the religious establishment. But they're also probably at least upper, upper middle class or so, at least definitely the Levite. Because in our day, we tend to think of religion as just a piece of ritual. But a priest and a Levite, they have to be both educated men. And especially the Levite, the temple is a very powerful, um, a very powerful institution in this culture. And so if you are one who up, um, upholds and works the temple, you, you can't just be just nobody. And then along comes this person who, in this society, you know, so you have, you have well-to-do, educated, highly respectable figures. When it comes to someone really hurting there on the street, one of their own, one of their own ethnicity, and then comes along this person who is generally just, are you kidding? They don't have the right theology. They have a corrupted religion. And they are of a race and ethnicity that we really look down upon. And here he comes. And this is what he does. A Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he, that is the person who had been robbed and beaten, was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. Here's the word, compassion. And um, just, a, just a quick word about this. In the Greek, it's this idea that compassion is, is a spilling out. This, it's a spilling out of our, of our, of our deepest of our deepest lower, this, it's really like our intestines, right? And so something in, in our deepest, in our deepest, in our, in our soul, it's this picture is, is spilling out. And he had this, he had compassion. And not just, it's a really understated way. And then listen to what he does. He went to him and bound up his wounds. I'm not sure how he did that. I mean, was he expecting to do that? But, um, you know, he took time. This wasn't, a, this wasn't a, this wasn't, it was a clear and strong interruption. And it didn't, he didn't take five minutes. He bound up his wounds. Pouring on oil and wine. So he must, he had some provisions. Um, oil, particularly, wine may have been common. <laughs> it may have been very common because this isn't a society where people are carrying around you know, water. A water is a, but wine is a, is a common drink. We, we tend to think in our culture wine is a special drink, but wine is a common drink. But oil, um, to carry oil that you would put, pour on um, for the healing of somebody else. Uh, so oil has multiple different types of usages, but one of them is oil would be like a balm. And that is not cheap. That is not a cheap thing that you may carry. He, he's probably, he may be traveling. Um, maybe he carries it because he wants to bring it toward you know, somebody that he's visiting. Um, it's, it's an interesting thing that you would be carrying oil, uh, and it's something that you would put on somebody else as a balm maybe for their wounds. And so if you're carrying such a thing, either someone you know or maybe you yourself um, need some kind of medicinal treatment, and that would not be cheap. So right away, um, these are, you know, this is, the Bible tends to have um, very efficient and, and spare narrative. But inside, you have, to, you have a world. And here you can see right away, he's costing himself. Now, if that was what he, all he did, that would be a pretty good person. When you think, most of us are like, wow, that, that, that's a really, that's a, good, that's a good neighbor. But that's not all he does. 
Then he set him on his own animal. So now he has to walk. He has to inconvenience himself. And brought him to an inn and took care of him. So he brings him to an inn. I mean, so today you would bring him to, to the local Marriott or Hilton. And then he checks him in. And so whatever care this person needed, it wasn't enough to just bind up his wounds and to give him some medicine and then to be upon your way. He decided, I mean, remember, there's no ambulance. <laughs> Today, I don't know, maybe we would call an ambulance. That'd be, you know, something like a good, and then you would even maybe go. Today, I think this would be something like you would call an ambulance. Maybe you'd have to call the police. You would wait while the ambulance is there. You would go to the hospital. I mean, I, I'm just, I don't know. And even then, this isn't even in close because we have so much more resources in our day. I think even trying to, I'm, I'm trying to give us a flavor of what is being asked for here. And so he himself, the Samaritan, takes care of, of this broken, hurting person in the end. And the next day, so he spent the night. <laughs> Do you see it? Very, not all the details. So he had to spend the night. Maybe he had to get two rooms, one for, or, or maybe if the person's broken enough, maybe he, you know, spent, he's, you're spending the night. Maybe it's a two-bedroom, right? You have two, I mean, you know, I can't imagine that, uh, that uh, a, a, mot a motel or a hotel, even in, in the first century, you walk in, there's only, I mean, who would, who would, uh, you know, who would have only one bed? Even back then, you know, at the very least, couples are probably traveling together. Friends are traveling together. Family is traveling. So maybe you would sleep in one bed, but you're sleeping in a bed while the other person is sleeping in a bed. as a stranger. And the next day, he took out two denarii. That is out two days' worth of wages. So that's how they did this. Um, so... Just, I want you to just do a quick little mental check. If you were to divide all that you make, in, and then you would figure out how many days a, a year that you typically work, and then figure out you know, what it makes. That's not a small amount of money, is it? Especially in our city. So it's a pretty serious sacrifice. He's already given up. Um, he's already given up his drinking, his drink, wine. He's already given up his... Um, some wealth through the medicine, which is costly. He's given up his time. He's given up um, money to pay for an inn. And now he pulls out a pretty serious chunk of money, and he hands it to the innkeeper and says, take care of him, and whatever more you spend. So... It's like it's a pretty serious tip if you ask me. I mean, you know, obviously the innkeeper is like, what? Why do I have to do this? Well, you, well the person's going to want to be paid. Take care of him, and whatever you, more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. So now, he is giving up a really serious amount of money so that somebody else can give care, and he's going to come back. <laughs> he's going to come back. And if it costs even more... I'll give you that too. So don't worry about the money. Whatever money it takes to really help this person get back on his feet, I'll pay that. And then Jesus asked this question. So who do you think was a neighbor? Well, the one who showed mercy. There's our word. Mercy. Do you notice in this passage? And this is, by the way, where we get words, why we even use the word like this. Typically, in, in, um, in our day, we, mercy, we tend to think of it as, as primarily just compassion. We have a feeling of compassion, but that's not the way the Bible looks at mercy. Mercy should result toward action, and it's particularly towards someone who really needs help. And, um, and then here it goes, Jesus, well, well, the one who showed mercy, well, that's the way you should be, do it too. That's the passage. Now, if I ask you that question, how much compassion should we have? To what extent should we go? I mean, you already know the answer. I mean, um, most of you have heard the story. I, I decided to just break down 
what he did in a little more detail so we can really see the extent. It's a lot. It is a lot, is it not? And in our culture, um, you know, most of us are going, Pastor, I'm really busy. <laughs> you know, we, and um, what if I see someone, you know, dying on this? Am I supposed to stop before I'm on the way to work? I could get fired. Uh, a, a number of you, um, I mean, a number of you go, go on business trips, so am I supposed to stop? I, I have a plane to catch. Uh, uh, that's, 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 that's common in our city. Um, like, you know, I could probably spare the monies. I mean, a number of you might say these um, things, and that's probably true. But I don't know if I could spare the time. <laughs> and some of us say, well, even if I, some folks say, I, I, I might be able to spare the time, but I don't think I could afford doing anything like this. And so, um, again, this passage, and, and we looked, or if you've already looked at passages like this, the burden seems very large, and it's very strong, is it not? Now, um, I want to I say something in a couple things as, as we wrestle with this passage. There are people in, who, um, who in our city who need help like this, right? And I'm not even just talking about, um, you know, someone who's begging. Um, this, this, I think, <laughs> it's a great illustration today. Um, a number of our members are going to go to this beautiful ministry called Heritage Home that's right in our city. And um, the Heritage Home ministers to women who had an unintended pregnancy. And as we saw in, in, in the video um, a few weeks ago, a number of them had drug addiction. And they were desperate. They didn't know where to go. And so they're going to go. and th So they enter into this ministry where you get to go and live in this house for a year. And until... Your need is you can have this, your baby, and you can get helped with your drug problems, and you can gain skills to get back on your feet to find a job, and, you can, and people will come there to minister to you both with the gospel and to help you with skills to, to help be a mother. <laughs> um, and so it's an incredible ministry. And I would say, in, in, in a nutshell, doesn't that sound like a good Samaritan ministry to you? And if you, put it th if you put it this way, um, one of the points I want to make is in order to do this kind of ministry, I don't think the Lord is saying, I mean, in one sense, you go do it. But how, for the, to, be, to be real, no one person could do this. And remember, this is a parable. This is a parable. This isn't a story about, about a, his, a, a, a historical event. It is a parable. I mean, it probably wasn't a historical event because it probably would never happen. The racism was so thick in this society. I mean, although if it would happen, Jesus is implying it was more likely the Samaritan would help the Jews than the other way around. I mean, that is partly what he's implying. But he's saying, this is the kind of love for our neighbor that we should have with great mercy. And one of the first points I want to make as we do this is, I think... The, one of our takeaways from this passage is there are many people who are like this, and, but, they, but they're not necessarily because they were robbed. Um, I mean, some of the women um, who, you know, we could see that they probably, they probably come from a broken home. <laughs> if they ended up on drugs, um, you know, usually if you come from a two-parent household, um, you know, the, there's a, and they're very loving, and the marriage is good, the chances of children going on drugs is far lower. You know that? I mean, it can happen. It still happens. But it's far lower. And, um, and so these are some of the issues. And one of the first ones I want to say is maybe this isn't something we can do as individuals. So sometimes when people read this story, we read this thing through the, 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 the cultural limitations and blindness of a culture. We we're very individualistic. When we, read, when we think about things, we only think about what am I supposed to do? And then when we look at this passage, it just seems to be about one really super, super neighbor kind of person doing a, a, a great super charitable deed for somebody else who's not even of, of the same race or ethnicity. We're like, wow, that's really great. And, you know, most of us, we go, that's a, you know, it's such a powerful story that, um, you know, everybody knows of this good Samaritan. You know, it's just common. 
um, piece of language in our culture. But, um, and most of us know, I can't be a good Samaritan. By yourself, we probably can't be. But together, we can. Together, we can. And I, I, I think it's just fantastic that we have this ministry. So it's not even a theory. <laughs> it's not like we live in a city and I'm telling you about some ministry that's in New York <laughs> or that's in Chicago or, or LA. We are talking about that, that's right down the street. We're talking about a ministry that is very, very much a Good Samaritan ministry. And people gave up a home, um, tremendous piece of sacrifice. I mean, I don't know when they gave up that heritage house, but can you imagine what that house must be worth today? A sizable house that can uh, take in multiple people in, um, in San Jose. I mean, literally, it was a million-dollar sacrifice. Now it is, anyway. And now, and the people who come and volunteer, and the money that it must take. So the, the, this mercy, this work of mercy, isn't so much an individual, um, an individual piece of obedience to Jesus. It is a corporate piece of obedience. And that's one of the most important things. I want to I just say a quick uh, word about this. So many people... Um, you know, this is a, you know, I want to make a critique of, of our, um, you know, so many people in our culture tend to think, oh, you know, I want to make a difference, you know, toward, toward people who are hurting. You know, immediately they, uh, they realize is if you're wise, you realize you need, you need other people to help you. E- even non-Christian people know this. They usually go, then they go find some organization. Or sometimes what do they do? They start an organization. Christians do the same thing. We know we can't do it. Um, I've been trying to mobilize people in the church, and then it started off with five people and then ten people, and then we raised some money, and then next thing you know, well, then we know, you know what? It, so it grew so big, it had to grow outside of our church, so we had to go get our own 501c3 from the IRS, and it became its own special ministry. That is an absolutely beautiful way. So that's one of the, the, one of the first things I want to say. It takes more than one person. But now let me, but let, now let me stop, though. But it still takes an individual who has this person's heart. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? We can't do this piece of mercy on our own. But this mercy cannot happen unless individual people, you, I'm saying you, me, okay, I, I'm pointing you, that it starts with a deep heart of compassion. It starts in, the, in this person's soul. And there can't even be the idea for it if you don't have a depth of compassion. And you can't have the motivation for it, and you certainly can't have the vision for it if you don't have this piece of faith. This is such a powerful word. And, I'm, and, and let me say a little piece of this. One of the reasons, do you know that um, you know, a lot of, 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 uh, of what we call these NGOs and a, a lot of um, amazing charitable um, works and ministries that, that happen even internationally around the world. You know where they started? They started from the West. <laughs> they started out of Europe, especially out of America. And you know why? If you go into the middle of Africa, it's not like they have lots. Of, they're, they're, they're starting to. But if you went 50 years ago into the middle of India or even Korea, would you have had ministries like this? Very, very few, <laughs> if, if any at all. And why has such incredible, powerful, good Samaritan ministries where they've risen? Because there's a passage called Luke chapter 10 in the culture, and they believe this is a word from God. So I'm not trying to make so much a criticism of like, oh, you know, know, we're, we're superior. No, we're not superior. What we have is God's word, and people in our culture have believed it. And it's just a matter of time, by the way, when the Africans have these ministries and they'll probably send them to us, all right? Because we won't do this piece of mercy for our neighbors. And so African Christians, you know, 30, 40, 50 years from now, you know, as they develop, you know, from Asia, they'll, they'll start coming to us. When we start going to the poorest countries and the poorest people on the planet, we'll, we'll be bumping into uh, not just Westerners. So this is, what's, this is a, a point I want to make about corporate versus individual. It takes a corporate movement. 
But that corporate movement cannot happen until individuals have the faith in this passage and the heart. Now, I want to say one more thing before I go to part two, which is, um, I said this before a, a, a few weeks ago in my message, but I want to reiterate it here. It's very important. Some people hear this and they're like, oh, we just want to solve world hunger. Um, at the most ambitious level, that's what Christians have tried to do. <laughs> All these, um, you know, I don't know if when you when you watch them. When I was growing up, you know, you watch these, uh, you know, these images of, of starving children in Africa or something like this. Who do you think started those those those, uh, those agencies and those ministries? Christians. Um, the one I remember was Ch Christian Children's Fund, and the famous actress who was the face of that was Sally Struthers. She was very famous in the 1970s, right? It was Christian Christian Children's Fund (CCF). Who do you think started that? Um, but that isn't really the call to so-called solve world hunger, to fix every problem. Right? That is, in one sense, the ambition, but is it, the call is like there's a, a, a burden, this law of righteousness, and go out and just get everybody, and then people just, people just go, oh, it's just impossible, forget it. And it just becomes this grand law, it seems like. But if we do things because we're simply obligated by duty, then we're not operating out of the gospel. We're actually operating out of a certain legalism. What is the gospel way of doing it? The gospel way is not necessarily, here's a big you know, demand from God, and now everybody's just obligated to go do it, and everybody, you know, out of guilt, we're just going to you know, try to go fix the world. God didn't say, God, the Son of God did not say to fix the world. What did he say? Show mercy on your neighbor. So here is this good Samaritan. Did he go, well, you know, that's just hurting people all around on my route, and I have to go fix everybody. <laughs> I'm going to go help everybody. No, that, that's not what he did. He didn't help everybody. He helped one person. He helped a specific person, a specific kind of person, and a specific kind of need that was given to him. Our call is not to go fix the world. There's a certain neighbor or a certain kind of neighbor that's put before us, and we have a specific call from God to love him or her or them. You know, just as an example, in, in, in our, and it could be a small number of people. It could be a large number. In the West, again, we tend to think grandiose. We're very practical. But God, God cares about one person. Ministry that could take... You know, this, 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 uh, this heritage home ministry, it's very inefficient in one sense from a world's perspective. So a house, which is now worth a million dollars, was given up. And now we, uh, this ministry has to go forward, and we need lots of volunteers, more, probably more volunteers than there are people that are being ministered to. But if you think about that, it seems very, very inefficient. That's... That's fine for the Lord. Go love your neighbor. I think loving one or a few is just as worthy, according to Scripture, as loving, oh, we got to reach all of, you know, starving Africa. I mean, come on. And so that's the next point that I want to make. The passage does not say solve world hunger. It says show mercy on your neighbor. Um, an example, right in our own church, we have a ministry, a beautiful ministry. Um, our, you know, it has a Korean name, um, Sarangjigi, which literally means to be sowing in love, right? And it's a, it's a, a, it's a, special, it's a special mercy ministry for um, special needs. So they can come and receive gospel worship specifically just for them. And in our church, since it's run by um, you know, the Korean-speaking congregation, that's a really small, it's an even small, it's a sm small number of people in our city, and then they're Korean speaking, so it's even smaller than that. Although, by the way, do you know that that, that ministry <laughs> is growing? I think, um, I think they're up to eight, nine, ten regulars before they used to have reg three or four regulars. That's a good Samaritan ministry. <laughs> Very, from a worldly perspective, inefficient, but more than worthy. Now let's go to part two. Um, what kind of mercy shall we 
pursue. Or let me put a, a, another point to it. Um, relief, rehabilitation, development unto the full dignity of the image of God. Maybe that's what I'm really going to. I kind of that was going to be my original, but that seemed like a, a big mouthful, right? What kind of um, mercy shall we pursue? I, I want to give you some wisdom points out of this book, right? And um, this book is called "When Helping Hurts: How to Alleviate Poverty Without Hurting the Poor or Yourself." Right? That's the name of the book. "When Helping Hurts: How to Alleviate Poverty Without Hurting the Poor or Yourself." Written by Steve Corbett, who's a pastor, um, superb minister of mercy. And the other guy's name is Brian Fickert. So it's co-written by two guys, um, uh, both, you know, godly Christian men. And Brian Fickert, so Steve Corbett is a pastor. Brian Fickert is an elder in his church. Brian Fickert is actually a professor of economics at Covenant College, which is, uh, which is a, a denominational, um, it's, a, it's a college out of the denomination of the Presbyterian Church in America. So it's Presbyterians. And they wrote this fantastic book. And um, this book, you know, the, 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 this is actually a little bit older edition. There's a newer edition with a, a little you know, different color. They've, you know, they've added some, you know, some, some other um, you know, cool content. But um, I want to just say a little something before I get into this. If you are serious about doing ministry, most of us don't know what we don't know. We think if I just go help that person in the street, then, then I've done, yeah, that's true. But now you've done a, a relatively low piece of ministry. If you really want to make this type of good Samaritan difference, we need to learn some stuff. And um, so one of the first things I want to say is I hope many of you will take the call to mercy very seriously. If I had my way, every single member of our church would read this book. <laughs> I think that's, that's how fantastic this book is. And it won't tell you everything, but wow, it will put you on. It, it's, it's very, very eye-opening. It will challenge and reshape the way you think about a lot of different ministries. And I love the fact that this book has, is being translated, and it should be. This should just be a classic. And so I think this, should be, this book should be up there with like mere Christianity or something like that with C.S. Lewis. And if I had my way, every member of our church would read this book. Okay, so... Um, I want to teach you a, a, a couple important things out of this book. First is that, me, um, that mercy isn't just one monolithic way of doing things. Typically, if you hand, let's say, um, money to a beggar on the street, that means they have immediate emergency need. <laughs> immediate emergency need, and that like they can't seem to get from anywhere else. And so we're gonna, and so that is, you know, you know. The, well, like a soup kitchen, somebody who's, who's maybe on, on the street and they're hungry or they're down and out and they don't have food or money to have food and so they can get a meal. Um, that is relief ministry. Right? So I want you to think about mercy in three, in, three different pop, in three different buckets. One is relief ministry. In America, when we think of mercy, we typically think about relief. Relief is the easiest. In one sense, it is the quickest and um, it is the simplest, but it's also the lowest. <laughs> um, rehabilitation, what is rehabilitation? Rehabilitation is somebody who is really broken and hurting in their life, and I tend to think of them as like, you know, they've fallen in, in, into a hole. How can we help pull them out so that they can begin to come back on their feet and start taking control of the, over their life? So that would be rehabilitation. Um, the, the Heritage Home is a kind of rehabilitation ministry. That's the way I would. I would, I would. They do rehabilitation because here is a, a, a poor woman who is pregnant. She doesn't have anywhere else to, and she has drug addiction. And so how can you help her? One, there is a kind of relief. There could be a relief. If she's homeless, that's a, there's a relief need. Immediately she needs housing and protection. But beyond that, how, if you just say, well, you know, we gave you a couple nights in the home and some meal, thank you, that obviously is not going to help her. Right? That's going to be far short of what she needs. Um, if she has, she needs to get, to conquer her drugs <laughs> addiction. She needs medical care. Maybe because if she has a, a drug addiction issues, then that's going to affect her body, which will then maybe affect her baby. <laughs> and then she may need some, um, forms of help to, you know, get, get on her feet. Maybe she needs to finish school. 
or maybe she needs some kind of job training. So all these things so that she can begin to move toward the third one. The third one is development. So I, I, I tend to think of relief as the simplest and the lowest level of mercy. Rehabilitation, one, for someone who is really in a, in a, in a hurt, hurt place, to bring them back up to a level to be able to, um, to operate in society again. But what's development? Development is to take a person who, and then develop them. It may be more schooling. Or it could be a whole population of people, and maybe um, they're down at their schools are really terrible. So in, 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 our, in our country, you know, people are coming, and you know, you know, as we, this, is a, uh, this, this passage also talks about race, but there are whole neighborhoods where people tend to be uh, poor or different race. And guess what? Their schools don't tend to be good. And so maybe what they need are better schools. Maybe they need systems to help train them to get a better job. And so think about this. This is not a one-day process or even a few-week process. It could be a year's process. It could require, really, the tackling and challenge of a whole new kind of culture. There could be injustice in the community. Um, in, in our history, and I would say probably even still now, there are still neighborhoods where the reasons why, why those schools aren't as good or why some people are denied jobs is because they're the wrong race and ethnicity. <laughs> in other words, just because there's just straight racism and prejudice. And so mer development ministry, this is, I, know, I don't know, this might sound strange to you. You might not immediately know somebody that you're directly helping, but if you can help change the systems in the city to help schools be better or to help training, you're doing mercy. <laughs> You're doing development mercy. And a lot of people don't think of that. We just immediately think of the poor person. Oh, they're hurting right now. Let's help them right now. But what if a whole culture is hurting? Um, what if uh, uh, there are, like, in, in a lot of poor communities, there are, there's very little in the way of, of, of marriage, of just working marriages. Um, do you know that if you go into a community, build relationships, and then help teach them about marriage? and show them new marriage example, and help save marriages, that's a tremendous piece of development ministry. You're helping change cultures. You're saving, literally, not just saving um, young children or poor, you're saving, you're redeeming whole families. So relief, rehabilitation, and development. And I want to tell you something that, that this, this guy, Steve Corbett and Brian Fickert, they say. Um, it's challenging. I reread chunks of this book. Um, in preparation for this message. One of the things they say is actually Americans, we should mostly be working the vast majority of the mercy we do because most of the people that we meet don't have an emergency relief need. But most of the mercy that happens, at, especially at churches in America, they tend to be relief work. But actually, we should really, mostly we should be doing rehabilitation and development work. And quite frankly, they say that people who do relief work, say often can't, usually are not good at doing, I mean, think about that. Um, sometimes, for instance, they give you an example. Sometimes people need to learn how to handle their money better and then repay their debts. But they, don't, they, they never come from a culture or their family life was chaotic or they never had a good example of having, um, of, of, of having financial um, responsibility. And so part of rehabilitation or development is to teach them financial, re um, you know, to teach them about things like credit, credit scores and bank interests because you can live in communities where there's no working bank and the only way you can get a loan is to get ripped off by essentially a loan shark who's, who is, a, who is uh, ripping you off with incredible amounts of interest, which should be illegal amounts of interest. And so there is a tremendous piece of development ministry, but in order to teach this person how to have better um, financial, financial uh, responsibility, it may require a, a tough love. It may require, they may need to like fail in their thing, and then you're just like, sorry, I'm not going to bail you out by handing you some money. You need, because they, they, they may not want to change. <laughs> or they don't know how to change. Or they don't, they don't, and so sometimes they have to, have t some tough love. So sometimes the person who has the compassion to immediately give relief help 
isn't always the best person to do some kind of development ministry where you have to have a little bit more tough love. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? And so that's, I think, tremendous piece of wisdom out of this book, right? Relief, rehabilitation, and development. And in our church, I hope our church grows out and that some of us will have the Samaritan's heart, the good Samaritan's heart, but then we'll work together and we'll think of some creative ministry. Or if we don't do it, at least we will then go support. And I love that a number of you have already done the research and found a very worthy you know, rehabilitation and development ministry like, like, like Heritage Home. Okay, so relief, rehabilitation, development. I want to um, say um, something else. Um, chain, helping the... Those who are poor, especially if they're chronically poor or they're generationally poor, it isn't easy. Why? Well, partly because they're, they may be in a culture which, which pushes them down and causes cycles of poverty. Or two, they may just be sinful and like hurting themselves. And they don't want to change some of those habits. That's common. We all know that too. And so, but if we, I'm not poor. <laughs> I'm not poor, and so I'm going to help these poor people. Then one of the great problems of that is the way that, the way that um, this book puts it. There's a, they have this equation that the, they put, Let me see if I have this right. They say that first in our society, we tend to think about poverty primarily, primarily as issues about lack of money. But what this book, which is absolutely right, is, in, in, is that people are not just poor in money. They have a, a lack of knowledge. They have a lack of relationships, and then they have a poverty in their spiritual life, too. So that one of the pieces of poverty isn't just, we tend to fixate on the money portion. And then I do better with money, and I know how to handle money, and I have a better job, and I'm not irresponsible with my debts. But so then we go in, and then the, this book says that what we tend to do is we tend to define poverty out of the material. And since we seem to be better on the material, then when we go help the poor, we tend to have what this book accuses us of having a God complex. And it's one of, the, one of the first things that we must understand is if we're really going to be Samaritans, good Samaritans, the way the gospel, what Jesus calls us to be, one of the things we have to understand is the poverty is more complex. And what they need are more people. People who don't have a pride God complex and define everything according to money and, and achievement. Or, or, or I gave you some money and now you're not so poor. Or we gave you a house and now, you know, you, now you're not homeless. But what if they don't know how to, how to keep, keep up that house? What, what if they don't know how to have a job um, so they can keep, you know, keep paying for that house? They're just going to lose it. And they say there are many examples of churches that have done exactly such things. Rich American churches go to some poor country and we build them a church. We build them some, and we're like, okay, we did our good job because, okay, we have money, we have know-how, and we gave you some material advantage now. We did a good job. But actually, they said we hurt them. <laughs> because what we taught them is we're, we're, we're the real savior, you're inferior, we did something for you, and now you're constantly dependent on us. And what we really didn't do is we didn't help them restore them to their full humanity in the image of God. And what they need for that is they need relationships. They need the gospel. They need, they need wisdom given to them, but not with condescension. <laughs> and guess what? We have lots of lack, too. What we're going to find out when we go into this is that they know things that we don't know. And they are more than capable if they'll be brought out of the, of the greatest rehabilitation there ever is, which is the rehabilitation out of sin, right? The greatest mercy ministry there ever was was our need to come out of the hole of sin. So... Um, I'm going to, um, I'm, as usual, I'm going to, I'm going to close my message, right? I'm going to close my message with a, a little story to help uh, tackle and repent of our God complexes as we then engage together, something like maybe development and rehabilitation ministry. And one 
Um, uh, one other great uh, you know, insight they have is like, first, instead of just going with like, what's their need? What's their lack? Instead, why don't we look at what do they have? What has God given them? Because it speaks to them of something that God has already blessed them with. And now we're going to encourage them, you have much in the way. And there's some place where you lack, and then we can come along. But instead of immediately looking at lack, let's look at, at what he calls um, their assets. And the assets aren't just about money. It's, it's about their skills and their gifts from God. And I want to close with this message about helping them become more, more fully human. So...